In today's episode, we're joined by former Division One soccer player Bernard Bertzbeck. He started his journey back in 2019 and graduated this year from St. Peter's University, located right outside of New York City. Welcome. Thank you. So you ended up St. Peter's, New Jersey. Uh, could have sent you as a skier to the U.S., not as a soccer player? Or is that, I, I uh, think if I chose differently, you probably could have sent me as a lot of different things. I am... Um, <laughs> I played both hockey, skied, like both alpine skiing and uh, free skiing up until I was like 14. And then I got put down to the second team on the football team. And then I decided that I, I didn't really enjoy being on the second team. So I had to, I don't know, like I had to stop all of the sports apart from one if I wanted to like actually do it seriously. But it, it, it became the, the football because of, I guess I just got put down to the second team. Uh, the competitive uh, nature. I think that just killed me, yeah, so I couldn't be on the second team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's fine, but you're still a good skier. I think you could have skied in college. I am, um, I'm not sure. I think if I, if I went for it, I probably could have. And a lot of the friends that I skied against when I was competitive are like, I mean, Birk, one of the guys who's a free, uh, free skier or freestyle skier, He's won an Olympic, and Lucas wins a bunch of World Cup races. So it's it's interesting to see. Whereas like in Norway, if you're okay, or if you're decent, you're probably pretty good yeah, compared right. to probably. like I mean, yeah, your, mo your mom seven. has an Olympic gold medal. Yeah, she so was also uh, pretty good at some point. Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, it's always fun to speak to her in the, in, in the process. Um, but obviously, there's no there's no skiing in Jersey, uh, so probably would have gone to maybe New Hampshire territory trolls if we're. Uh, I mean, you could have skied in college too. Yeah, sitting S here with two skiers that played soccer in college. Yeah, yeah, it's just a big commute from Frederikstad up to the mountains in Norway, so I had to choose what was easier for me back then. But yeah, uh, and interestingly as well, you are you both don't have knees pretty much. The meniscus pretty much gone from yeah. from both of you. I think that's the main issue of like being a a skier early and then like going into football because then you like messed up your knees pretty bad while skiing and then you just completely ruin them when you start playing football for full time yeah. all right but we'll, we'll dig into your uh, to phase one here talking about uh, you know you choose your football uh, soccer and then you know that becomes your your main sport and then you want to go to the US and I, um, before we go there your English by the way it's it's, it's very good you Thank were a bit you. nervous that oh is this podcast in English what I don't know but I, I didn't know and it's uh, I think even though it may sound okay, like there's the vocabulary, it doesn't come as, it's not as fluid as it is when you've been in, in the States for a couple of months, then it just goes like without really thinking at all. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. well, it seems like you're on autopilot, but it's, good. Okay. it's a compliment. So four, four years in, in New York, I mean, maybe not New York, the New York accent. New York. Uh, I'm not, like, I haven't really adapted the New York accent, I would say. I'm, I've tried not to adapt too much of an accent because I think like it's, in my uh, in my opinion, it sounds better if you just have like an extremely good vocabulary and you're good at speaking English, but you're not like over exaggerating it. Because I feel like if I would be like speaking too much American accent, it would just I don't know. I am Norwegian after all, so I f I think it sounds okay if you have like a bit of Norwegian accent uh, on it. It's a li little bit of uh, yeah, a little bit of, like a tiny bit of Petersburg in there, but like <laughs> still with like good vocabulary. Uh, I don't know what you call it in English, but in Norwegian we call it air condition. Yeah. That's a legendary quote there from, from, <laughs> uh, from him. Um, but I, I remember, can't remember how we got in touch, but we we ended up in touch when you were in in high school. Uh, probably second year of high school and you're you've got a year and a half left something like this and and you hey time to decide what i'm gonna do when i grow up uh type yeah. of thing and then you you came to our showcase uh as a starting point just to you know test the waters H how was the showcase event for you i think um i think i was a bit nervous because i at that point at that point and also uh later on in my career i had a lot of injuries so I was like, I wasn't really in like a very good, f call it a flow state. Um, so when I got there, I think I was like, probably like half injured, uh, hadn't been playing too much. So I was a bit nervous, but it was also a great opportunity to s see how many and also like what other people who's 
uh, trying to do the same thing as you want to do, which is going over there. And then you also got to meet some of the coaches. So I think it was a good experience. But um, yeah, I can't, we talked about it before we started recording, but I can't remember if I decided on a school like after the showcase or like if, if the showcase was the reason why I chose the school that I did or if it was. Yeah, no, I think you uh, definitely chose after, but I, you, you, I think you came to the showcase and then you, after that, kind of got through it. Okay, yeah, this is definitely what I want to do. But then we also, we, we, the showcase was in December and then you didn't have any video. This was <laughs> in the days where not every game was filmed. I mean, you had some injury problems and then... Because you, you started early, right? This was very early yeah. compared to others that might start it a year later than you, right? Yeah. And go for a showcase and then they go the August, the year after. Whereas you showcase, then you I start your process yeah. and then got video during spring, summer that year. And then you're going August the following year. So you, you had a lot of time, uh, which is not maybe s as usual, but it's a great way to do it, in our opinion, because it, it means you have... Uh, longer time to get video yeah now it's easier um but also to sp there's more coaches looking yeah. um but it might have been the interest from from the the showcase that uh, that that helped in your process too i think so and it's also uh i was pretty like i think before the showcase i was pretty certain that it was what i was doing and then after the showcase i was 100 percent sure and because i started so early with the process it was just nice to kind of get a good offer and then say yes to it and then kind of knowing what I was doing after uh, high school instead of like walking around the hot like half a year being like, I don't know, I don't really want to go to the military. I don't want to do this. I don't know what to do. And then you just end up stressing a bit whilst I was pretty, pretty calm and relaxed for the last at least the last half a year of high school. I think it was. Yeah. It helps to do it that way, uh, and of course, as we know, trolls, it's not uh, it's not set in stone how a recruiting process will be. They all, all live their own lives, uh, of course. But uh, I mean, trolls is the complete opposite of you. <laughs> he decided yeah. Yeah. super late, and uh, I mean, he was you were in your gap year too, so yeah. you didn't have any school to worry about, no. uh, and you you came into your. Uh, your meeting with uh, Stu uh, to talk about the college process in a pretty much a tuxedo because you were working at a, at a high end uh, fashion store and you came straight from work. So we was like, oh, this this guy is really <laughs> serious about his college application. Okay. Yeah, I I remember it was I think it was mid or late April maybe, and then um, yeah, Stu saw me in a suit and thought, all right, I gotta I need to help this guy out. So yeah. Um, Fixed me up and sent me to Boston two, three months later on. So, yeah. Yeah, we, we delivered that too. Yeah. So Pretty stress-free that as well <laughs> if you started. Yeah, okay, yeah. well, good. So when was that? How, how long is that ago? Oh, that is, yeah, close to 10 years how ago long? now. Well, 2014, 20, 2015, yeah, something like that, I, okay. I guess, yeah. yeah. Oh. But... Uh, not that many decide that early they wanted to go to college. I mean, the wh why did you even think in those lines? Um, I think it was a combination of seeing, uh, like, a lot of my closer, like, family friends. Uh, they have sons or daughters that's done the same thing. And then that made it possible for them to both uh, be active. And I'm like, I, ne I need to do something physical in order for me to, uh, I don't know, be... I don't know, able to be around people and be comfortable with people because it's just like I have too much energy. So if I don't move around a lot, I get a bit restless. Um, and I also obviously love football and I, I still do, but at a, um, in a different way, I guess. Uh, so I wanted to be able to pursue my other um, career choices while I was playing football at a pretty decent level. And then because I saw that people around me did it and made it possible, I... Uh, I think I just like saw it as a very good opportunity, both to get to where I want to be, uh, which was at the time New York and around the area there, um, while also playing football. Um, so it was just like a, a, a nice combination of being very active, getting a degree, uh, and also being where you want to be. So you got 
accept uh, some advice and, uh, and and help from others in your circles and Mikkel Røysland and, and the family and uh, you know yeah. good friends of I, you and the, and the mom and dad exactly I think it was like he helped me a little bit but I I think that was the reason why we worked with you was because the, we needed some professional help as well because <laughs> there's a lot of paperwork but at least he I asked him a bunch of questions, how it was and how he felt about it. And then, I don't know, that made me pretty confident that this was what I wanted to do. Yeah. So, yeah. And he, he, I mean, your shortlist was, okay, New York area, California or Florida. And he was down in Florida on the beach. So it ended up a slightly different beach than the one in New Jersey. But, yeah. uh, but still an inspiration, of course, to it see how he did. Yeah, I think so. And it's also that, like, I've been playing with uh, Mick Leinman and... I kind of knew where he was at when it came to like the level, and then it, then it was also comfortable to see that if I played as good as I knew I could, I would kind of handle the, the level pretty good. Yeah, um, but it, I mean, because you played third division in Norris, fourth tier. I mean, you yeah, you I were a good player, Bernard. I always liked how you uh, bossed the right uh, side <laughs> on the field uh, as a very offensive wing back. Uh, you yeah. you were great. Thank technical, you. very good, physical, you know. I think uh, I, w I was uh, pretty good when I was uh, a bit younger, before I got, like, all my injuries and stuff. And then I wouldn't say I was terrible when I played in the U.S. either, but uh, there wasn't too many games that I had the possibility to play because of injuries. But um, I remember when we put together the, um, uh, the video, as, like, the first position I had was, like, right back, and then it was right wing. And you, I think you, the first feedback you sent me was like, yeah, this video is incredible, but there's not one single defensive involvement. <laughs> uh, I think your coach might want to see that if you're a right back. But I think we ended up with like one single defensive involvement in the video. Yeah, uh, I mean, else? Coach Richens wanted something, uh, you know, a spectacular attacking threat from the right hand side. It, it uh, apparently, uh, uh, apparently. Yeah. Well, that's good. Um, but d deciding on a school. You know, I remember the, um, it, 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 in the end when we got all the, you know, the video, we got it the, to show who you are, including some tackles. Uh, and then, but, it, but it, it was a pretty straightforward case for you because they came in and we, we got a good offer from them that, that suited you. And then voila, it was, hey, I'm not, this is good. Yeah. wasn't it i mean that's how i remember it yeah i think i think you're right and also i think it's a bit about who i am as well it's like it, i wanted to be close to new york because of the art and everything uh that i was invol involved with and then i wanted to play d1 and then i wanted to get a pretty good offer so i didn't have to uh pay too much for tuition and all of that was in place and then for me it's just like okay i might wait for another offer it might be better uh but that's just not really how i work i guess if it's if it's good enough it's good enough and then you try and then you just decide on trying to make it as good as possible and work as well as it could because all the framework is there for it to kind of work out so i just decided that yeah why not let's try it it's interesting because these and with your roles uh tools now with the you know placing a lot of students i mean this happens not all the time, but quite often because it's quite a tailored approach to finding a school. And of course, we, you listen to what you wanted. And here, of course, you, it's, it takes time sometimes to find that. And uh, there might be a lot of rejection also from, you know, we speak to, to coaches and at schools that could be a fit, at least on paper and what, what the athlete wants. But then, but you also kind of want to shield the athlete from rejection. Yeah. So... But sometimes th we we might have gotten five rejections from places that kind of was on the short list. But then there might be a coach that uh, reaches out to a student and then they feel it's the first interest they have, right? But then, oh, but it's it's the it's the first one. I can't can't say yes to this. But I mean, sometimes you should because it's yeah. it's good, yeah, uh, and it it fits the criteria exactly. that you want. And that's the thing is like if it's the first. It, it is the first, but if it's good enough, then it, uh, it is also good enough. It doesn't really matter if it's the first or the tenth. If if it fills out your criteria, it, it still fills out your criteria, you know what I mean? Even if it's the first offer you get. Yeah. Uh, but you, you you get to New York. Have you been there before? Uh, um, I was there. So I, I've played with my best friend, Herman, 
who's uh, the goalkeeper. I'm not sure. Do you know who he is? I know who he is, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, we were there with both our families in 2010 when Herman and I were 10 years old. And I, I am pretty sure from that time on, I was pretty set on like going to New York. I wanted to like study in New York or live in New York or do something there just because it was, I don't know, I was a bit taken away uh, by the city. Um, and I think he felt the same way. Um, so, I don't know, I, I just always wanted to live there at some point, and this was a great opportunity, and then I was just lucky to get him along as well. I think it was like the last month or something, no, two months prior, I don't know, but like pretty, pretty close uh, on me starting at St. Peter's. They needed a goalkeeper because he moved on, I don't know what happened, but they needed a new goalkeeper, and Herman's a brilliant goalkeeper, so they just, yeah. I think I'm not sure. Was it you who helped him? With no, it didn't help him. I but I know he, he, yeah, he played in our showcase. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but recruiting never stops. That's the lesson to exactly. That one. So, so he like he was pretty like almost the opposite as me when it comes to like when he decided on doing it or like he wanted to go to St. Peter's, but then they didn't need a keeper because they had a keeper. And then like right before we were gonna start, they apparently needed a keeper. So. This is what happens. Yeah. Exactly. But he was open to it, so. Cool. Yeah. So, we have to talk about the 2019 season, your freshman year at, at St. Peter's, because that was a kind of a national spotlight season. A lot of wins, just uh, doing incredibly well. Because normally it was a, a season out of the ordinary for, for uh, St. Peter's. Yeah, it, it was a good season. I think um, I when I came down there, there was uh, another Norwegian guy who I've played with. We've forgotten to mention him, Frederick. Lindqvist. Exactly, yes. yeah. Um, and he played for St. Peter's the year before me as well. And um, so he gave me some insights on the team and he said that uh, there was a lot of quality players. Um, so that kind of also was one of the reasons why I came to St. Peter's, I remember. Um, but they were freshmen the year before me, a lot of them, and then they had gained some experience. So the second, se their second season or third season, and my first was, as you said, pretty unique. It was very cool to like go straight into that. Uh, it was just a good winning mentality all over. Yeah, but that, that's why b back to your like offensive uh, right back position. Because Frederick is an offensive-minded left-sided player, exactly. so you had the Scandinavian dynamite there. Yeah. Uh, so Julian really w knew how he wanted to play and what wh what he wanted his uh, outside backs to do. Because Frederick scored a ton of goals as well, yeah. uh, and, and he, he obviously saw your highlights and said, "Hey, this guy can." Uh, yeah. He's like a Cafu just on the right hand side, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's a relatively short college season. So how, how do you kind of cope? I mean, you came in with uh, some injury history, injury history and, and all this. How, how do you deal with uh, that? Also, when it's going well, you kind of want to push yourself a bit more. Exactly. You're a competitive yeah. guy, Bernard. So. Yeah, I think um, I came down there with a knee injury, uh, which was pretty bad. And then, so it was. I was a bit nervous because you obviously want to... I was working out or like I worked out pretty well uh, up until... Uh, the first season or like when coming down there, like your first college experience, you want to be as fit as possible. Uh, and I've, uh, I was doing a good job doing so. And then like the last practice before I went over to the States, I messed up my knee uh, properly for the first time. Um, so you, you didn't really like, especially when he brought me in, having the idea that I was going to like help the team win um, their division, etc., or like their um, what do you call the it? conference? The yeah. conference, exactly. Um, so it was like tough because you you want to do as good as possible, and when you're injured, you can't really do anything other than looking at other people play. Uh, but then when I gradually became like halfway injury free, I just wanted to like push it as far as I could. Um, so I don't know it. It's uh it's a different difficult balance because there's ten games that's like the conference games or at least we had ten games, so d it's and it's over a short span of time as well. So you would just want to like squeeze out all you have, and they also want to squeeze out all the juice you have to like just basically um, try and bring it home. Um, but then 
there were in the start I was able to play a few games and then I did my hamstring and then yeah it kind of like it uh, it just ended a bit too early for me but it was fun to watch the other guys play as well <laughs> yeah and you got you got 10 games at least it's like half half the yeah. season but uh, right it was a heartbreak uh, loss in the final 3-2 defeat so overtime it was you know. a traumatic experience for uh, for all of us uh, it would have been uh, just a perfect ending to the season well which it wouldn't have ended it you would have won the title and then you yeah. would have been dancing and, in the yeah, in the and playoffs nationals. and nationals but exactly. uh, but still i mean thir 13 honestly, wins like, was a lot amazing of the guys that i played with uh, and i still hang out with when i'm uh, back in the states that's finished with college we still talk about like we or not talk about that that day because uh, i think uh that rainy day yeah, in november uh, yeah exactly against like iona which was like our rivals um and it's also like with saint peter's they don't necessarily have the possibility to bring in quality players every year so uh, like sometimes they might get like lucky on their uh call it how they put together the team and i think it was the best team that they've had in a long time so th it, it had that like now or never feeling of it it's like oh shit we've won uh nine games in a row i think we drew one i, I can't remember exactly yeah, how it, was it, was. A, it was yeah something like that so it was, it was like, like this, yeah. it, it had never happened in mac history blah 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 so like it just had to happen this time and then it just kind of did not work out the way we wanted yeah. it to, but but so some you could say that because you talk about like the big schools in college and you know, the mid majors and some yeah. smaller schools and you put kind of uh, Saint Peter's in like the smaller school bracket. So, I mean, it's not a huge school with so many students, no. but you have another example of the basketball team uh, this year. Yeah. I mean, they did Incredible. unbelievably well at the, at the biggest stage of Mar March Madness. Yeah. I think they ended up like elite eight, something like that, which is quarterfinals. Uh, just uh, they they were the 16th seed in their bracket, and they just ended up surprising absolute everybody. But uh, you were uh, on campus for this. Uh, yeah, that was also a bit extraordinary. I think it's the whole mentality. It's like if you go to one of the larger schools, it's uh, almost expected. Whereas like at St. Peter's, it's like it's what we're striving for, but it's not necessarily expected. So it's like everyone, because the facilities that we had and the mindset that we had was like the underdog mentality. It's like, oh, uh, we're just about good enough to be able to do it if everything works out and we work as hard as possible, but nothing is expected of us. Um, and I think they, the basketball team had the same. They have, I think, like the way at least St. Peter's worked is that we don't necessarily get as much backing as the basketball program do because obviously they bring in a lot more supporters etc um so so they have uh, i don't know a lot uh, tiny bit better facilities and like more uh more coaches etc but uh i think it's the whole like small college school mentality where you're playing at a pretty okay conference so you go on like an, an away game to, let's say, Fairfield, one of the schools that we played against, where it's like you're going into a wardrobe that looks like it's Man United's like wardrobe, and you're like, okay, so some some students have it like this, but we're walking around in like a like a basement where it's like not there's not room for everyone, and uh, kind of have to take turns to like put on your boots because it's as narrow as it could be in a in a in a locker room. Um, but then when that, you when you play the games, you just oversee Manhattan, though. I mean, yeah, it's uh, exactly. the field so, is uh, like location. You you can you can't have it, you exactly. know, so it's both ways there, course. right? You so so, but of course, but you you get to experience both. And I mean, you because um, we we've had several uh, staff in the company have played at St. Peter's. They they they. But no one wants to it. come to St. Peter's. That's the thing, because we had the um, the game like the um, we had a grass field and not much. Or not many teams out of the conference had a grass field, and it's uh, it's not been taken care of as well as it perhaps could be. So no one really wanted to come there. Yeah, so it's your, it's your fortress with yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. We all had it was the called the fortress. Oh, it was yeah, called the like, fortress. Yeah, I didn't like, even know that. It's called Jaroszek, but we call it, I think probably everyone calls their own home yeah, home uh, field the fortress. Yeah. But it was because we didn't lose any games on it, and we're um, um, so it was like you 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 make like you make it what it like. If it it could be viewed as something negative, but for me and all of my teammates, it was like a blessing because that was the team we were. We were just like 
Yeah, but it, it must unite everybody at the school when you know the the soccer team they they do well and uh, do it tremendously well. The basketball team go on to you know make national headlines. I mean, it mm -hmm. unites the students at the school. Do you f did you feel a difference uh, when you were in a smaller school environment? I think es especially with the basketball team, um, it it had that effect. I think with uh, when we played well, it was like they were people talking about it, but like it. <sighs> Ba basketball will always basketball be bigger than soccer. Like, it was it, like you had like uh, news trucks all over the campus, and it's a small campus, so I was like dodging like people with re like reporters with mics all over the place, um, and it was like everyone like I was walking around in New York and like sitting at looking at one of the um, uh, games, and like everyone knows about it, like because uh, the college basketball program down there is like so big, so like regardless who you are you don't need to like really care about college or basketball and you could still know that like St. Peter's made it to the Nationals like yeah, last yeah is you, you, is, it's USA Today headline news yeah, pretty much to put that into perspective I think well many think that maybe college football college hockey and um, college basketball is even bigger you know than the NBA NFL and NHL right so it is tremendously big. Um, so I can imagine, like you know, having having your team uh, doing so well in March Madness. Yeah. Um, your your classmates, right? Because yeah. you, you, you go friends. to school with yeah. them. You <laughs> and that you was hang the weirdest. Out. And like I I enjoy basketball, but I hadn't really it had like I haven't thought about it that way as you described it now because I I didn't know either. I knew they were extremely good, and I've seen some. Uh, I've I've seen they, them play often. But I didn't really like catch that, so it was very strange when you're like in class with the same guys that's like headlining yeah. the news, and you're like, oh, okay, so nah, they weren't decent. They were extremely good at like playing basketball. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you know, how is it to deal with? Because uh, you had your fair share of injuries uh, <laughs> throughout your soccer career. Um, how do you deal with that? Because it, you know, you're you're in the end, you were. You're a definite starter for this team as long as you're healthy. Yeah. But it ends up the four-year career is kind of much smaller because you end up kind of playing two seasons, yeah. not four seasons, because of injury. Yeah, not not even almost. Um, I think the um, like the first season, as we spoke about the 2019 season, I had a like I was able to play ten games. I, I can't remember exactly how many, but then from there on, I was basically injured the whole time and the few games that I played I had either a torn meniscus uh, a torn hamstring or both <laughs> so um, it, it was very difficult and especially the first season where we were doing so well at the end and you just like you really wanted to help and you felt that you could help you felt that if you started you could bring something better to the team and then not being able to do it was pretty hard and it's also the thing that like they bring you in there to like make a difference and they at the end of the day they pay you a lot of money as well to go to the school and play football and you're not able to play football and i don't know at least for me because i'm very like i'm extremely competitive so if i um, have a goal i really want to reach it and then it's not that you don't want to or that you're lazy or anything it's just physically not possible because you're getting injured injuries all the time um, so at the end of the season in 2019, I remember I was pretty, pretty low. Um, and it's also a very different ideology of how they uh, view players because of the short season. So like if you're playing third division in Norway and you're injured, it's, you're, you're injured. Like they're not going to push you. And if they say like, ah, we might want you to play and you say, I don't really feel comfortable playing, then that's the end of it. Whereas uh, my experience was that like you have such a long off season that you kind of have to push through the um, the regular season uh, as far as it's possible. Obviously, if you if you like are uh, missing a leg, you're not, they can't uh, force I mean, it. I mean, <laughs> but for you're me, just missing a meniscus. Well, yeah, what's but the <laughs> but that was the thing for me. I played I played half like I played half a season with like a full on torn meniscus. And uh, most of the season in 2019 with a torn hamstring up until the point where I couldn't really walk anymore. Um, but you, you pushed yourself. It was like a combination of the it pressure was a combination of, of, of wanting. You, I, like I wanted it myself. But then it's also like it's, it's, there's a weird mix. Because obviously as a competitive athlete, you want to do it. 
but then there's al also like a whole medical staff so it's just like you're not used to the way it it is but then at the end there like the last year i couldn't play at all because i had a my second meniscus surgery and that and then they're very like call it or they were at least me like very respectful about it that like you've i've obviously pushed through a lot and tried my best to make it work it's not that i was like oh, i like my like nail is like halfway broken i can't play it was like physically like i just couldn't even even walk um so they kind of like i don't know i felt like an old dog that they're like they knew they were gonna like what do you call it like put away put at some point so they just like gave him a break and i was like allowed free to, now yeah like almost that way um but yeah and because i've like tried my best i, I played a season with a torn meniscus and i was eating um painkillers at a at a perhaps not a healthy rate so and then at some point you if it doesn't get better it doesn't work and you can't really attribute to anything because you can't run it's um yeah. ah, well you need to be able to use your legs in, exactly. the, in the game especially when it's quite uh, physical as well in, in the college game at the division one level of yeah. course but um it was i think all of the things that like all my injuries and everything that's happened on the field has kind of built the fundament of my of the experience that i had in college which was a very positive experience so it's like if if you ask me like what i was looking forward to before um starting college it was obviously there was going to be more uh weight put on like actually playing good football or like contributing to the team or like being a part of it um where I, while it's like now what i've extracted from my experience on college level is it's just something that i never thought of or like i knew i wanted to go to new york because i wanted to pursue art and like be around where it happens and where it culminates but I didn't know I wanted to like take it that far and me not being able to play football kind of nudged me in that direction. So it's like a blessing in disguise really. It's like it's one uh downside that kind of builds the fundament of all the other positives that I've taken out of it. Yeah. But it, you know in uh, you face difficult moments and you 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 have to kind of pivot right yeah. i mean you 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 were there during covid as well you yeah. know to throw that in the mix and that's the the word pivot okay you know it's like oh people didn't know what that meant before but now everybody knows what that means but that's a good example that you you had to do something uh, immerse yourself in something different because well, you, you you couldn't train as hard you couldn't i mean you were sidelined for <laughs> for months at a time here uh you know but you were all of course drawn to new york because of the the it's the big apple you're yeah. you're you're an artist bernard that's what you are uh, at heart uh, i think and uh, i guess y it must have been quite inspiring to be in this setting just waking up and say oh there's manhattan yeah. uh, uh how did you take advantage of the opportunity of the big apple because one thing is i go there another thing what you actually do with it um i think i uh, had to be a bit like uh call it shameless almost when it came to uh i wouldn't call it networking but to actually because i didn't know anyone who lived in new york like the college that i went to st peter's is in jersey although it's only 30 minutes away from it i mean at the end of the day we are e either at school or playing football until like six or like let's say you finish dinner at like 6 30. so if you think about it the rest of the day usually gets spent in the bed by most of the players or the people because we're pretty tired because we've been on it all day wh whereas like for me i had a very clear idea what i wanted to do and because i was so close it just like it felt like not an option to not uh take advantage of it so like pretty much every day i went into the city like just walking around like basically getting to know people like walking into like stores and then randomly being places and then happen to talk to people and then they're my friends still to this day so it's very like i think you have to push yourself out of it's a very like cliche thing to say but you have to push yourself out of the comfort zone especially as like a, a like a norwegian guy who's i wouldn't say i'm like introverted to any degree i i like speaking to people but still like going into a foreign place where you don't really know anyone and you don't necessarily speak their language as well as you speak your own it is it is a bit of a leap 
and you also have to, I don't know, push yourself to be in an uncomfortable situation there. But it's helped me a lot, and I've gotten to learn a lot of people that's interested in... I mean, you could think about it like making art and playing football at college is often viewed as like contrasts. So like I was a football player uh, until six, and then I was an artist from six till I went to bed. So I was either in Manhattan walking around looking like a fool from Norway, like talking <laughs> to people, or I was in my apartment uh, painting up until I went to bed. Yeah. Dr. Jekyll until six and Mr. Hyden after it that. Sounds, exactly. But it sounds like a pretty good life, though. It was. It? it was. I loved it, and I like. I still like it. Uh, I finished studying now in 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 um, in May. So like the this call it half a year is basically the only time I've had like full time disposable to making art, and it feels weird having like a whole day, like because I've been so used to having to plan. Uh, like ahead thinking like okay we're gonna have an away game this weekend that means we have one day off on Sunday I have to spend that full day painting and then I know that I finish classes like at two uh, on Wednesday and, I, and but we have like a day off then so I have to like paint all day you know what I mean so it's like uh, be creative then yeah, ex- this is time it's management like, it's but y- you get very good time management because you like walk around and you like yeah you spend a lot of time I don't know planning your trying to figure out how you could make time for painting, yeah. Well, yeah. but uh, graphic design was your major, right? And you that fits well. But uh, the, w- w- not that many people just know they want to be an artist and paint, right? I mean, and you're very good at it. You have your own exhibitions. It's it's unbelievably cool what you've done, and I I can see a lot of inspiration from you know your journey here. Um, but but how did the graphic design classes? help you i mean did, it, did that shape you in any way or form mm, i think so i for me i was very set on making art like painting specifically uh whereas the graphic design part was more getting a degree and then i was pretty clear on not getting a degree of like fine arts whereas like getting a more call it a more typical degree or, like graphic design is not very like formal but it's a bit more formal like it's a this is more um what do you call it predictable field um yeah, make me a logo yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll help you later <laughs> we'll talk about it but um so i think like most of the like my call it my um my interest was outside of college if that makes sense so like i love playing football i like graphic design but like my like the thing that I really want to pursue was outside of it but I still came out of college with like I don't know a a degree good grades a couple of awards and things so it's like it's nice to be able to do both where you both have um, the bachelor in your bag and you have call it like a um, security uh, net where it's like if things doesn't work out as you hoped it would with the art you still have a bachelor and a good experience Of course, the cap and gown moment, not too long ago. It was in May. Yep. Uh, parents came over, I, I, I saw. Yeah. Was it a big moment for the for the family and your, yourself? I think so. I'm not the best at, like, uh, call it celebrating moments when they're happening. Um, the, uh, probably not the worst either, but my mom, especially my mom, uh, is extremely good at it. So for her, I think it was pretty... I don't know, weird to see her youngest son being finished with uh, with a bachelor. So they were, I think they were pretty, um, I don't know. I think they were um, proud because, as I said, with the whole situation that, like, my main priorities was kind of making the art. So, like, getting through the bachelor and, and just uh, having that uh, in my bag was, was not as straightforward because I was spending a lot of time doing other things as well. Um, but then when... I don't know, I was able to push through. I think they were extremely happy for it. Yeah. I mean, did you have time to really speak with your <laughs> anyone at home? I mean, your schedule was just packed from no, the start. Not here. that much. No, I we obviously we did speak probably like once a week. Uh, and then like FaceTiming. I couldn't really like uh, not do it because obviously I wanted to speak to my family and my mom wouldn't allow it if I didn't. Um, so it just, uh, I don't know, it felt natural. Every Sunday we had a... We had a FaceTime call, 
uh, and it's just that's the way it was yeah. between your the brushes and exactly. the paint strokes. But I was I am very like uh, I get very almost like so focused that I get manic with things. So like I could just forget everything if I don't like my mom didn't call me. I would perhaps forget calling her. So I'm grateful that she did. Yeah. I remember when I came over, I um, this was before FaceTime and I mean Skype was the thing back then, but it was not that easy to have to coordinate when you were online with Skype. But uh, and I didn't have a cell phone my whole first year, I think. I just went with uh, you look at me like who are you? No, no, no. Uh, it's, but uh, <laughs> this it's different. remember that I'm older than you, uh, Bernard. Uh, yeah. So, but I, I called my my parents the first call I did back in, to to Norway, right? And this was probably after like three and a half, four weeks. It was from uh, a, f- uh, a payphone. Uh, in in the part you know in, in the area of the apartment complex where we lived that you know you I didn't even know there was a payphone there but there was one and yeah. then I called collect one eight hundred collect which means they have to pay for the yeah. for the do you accept, the this, call? Do you accept this call ah, yeah. and they did and we spoke uh, but that was like the, the the it was like no news is good news that's like <laughs> the rule in our family so yeah. okay yeah. I haven't heard from our son in four weeks uh, this new adventure but. Uh, but then, yeah, there's a collect call waiting. I hope that's good news. I think they must have thought when they got that. But it was all good From news. From county jail. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but I, th- I think that's a smart way to do it, though, because, uh, you know, I did it the same way, like once a week maybe um, at maximum. And I think, uh, you know, talking to your parents or your family every single day might give you uh, some more homesickness than you uh, would like to get. So I think it's good to, you know, understand that, you know, my life is here. And then, you know, once a week or once every two weeks, then telling them about your life here. And then they can tell them, tell you about life back home in Norway or wherever you are. So I think that's a good way to do it. I think a lot of people talk to their family every single day. And I think that might, you know, might get them more homesick uh, than they would like to. I oh. think so. I, I At least it's the thing of like. For me, it's like I know that like my my family, my home, everything like you've I don't know you've lived there for now 23, but then 19 years, and it, it's extremely comfortable. Yep. And like moving over to a new place with new people, with new everything, it's not comfortable. So like getting reminded that like you also have a life back home, which is 10 times more comfortable than perhaps where you are right now. And like comf- like being comfortable is not necessarily when you learn the most. So for me, it was just that, like, if I am one place, or I, I, I can't really be two places at the same time. So I'm either like fully committed on being here, and like dealing with all the challenges that kind of comes with being here, or I'm ba- or I'm back home. And that was not even like a, I wasn't like a, you don't even think about it when you're. This is what you're doing right now, and it's it's very different to what you've experienced, and that's why it kind of demands your full attention. Yeah. You you mentioned proud, and I think that's. I mean, you you've done so many cool things, Bernard, Right? You. I mean, you you've had exhibitions in New York as an undergraduate student, uh, where you you know you have a lot of pieces of art. People come and come and see what you've made. I mean, this is and all done through you just walking around Manhattan <laughs> or <laughs> uh, I don't know uh, Brooklyn I don't, you know yeah. how, how you must be quite proud of what you've accomplished uh, with with kind of your your New York ac- adventure which is not done yet you're, you're going back there soon now. yeah um. Um, I think I yes and also like it's not something that you like run around and think of all the time uh, for me I have like uh, perhaps, for example, now I just open an exhibition, and then you have like a moment where you, where you're finished with everything, all the preparations, and then you allow yourself to be like, okay, you know what, this this is pretty good. I'm extremely happy with the outcome, and I've had fun working up until it. And then you just start thinking about the next thing. Um, and I think for at least for me, I try and find more enjoyment in the process of how I made it happen, than of like doing it and then like being extremely happy for like five hours when it happened and then being miserable for the 90 percent of the process and then like you know what i mean so yeah. i tried to focus on like the actually enjoying walking around and like talking to people or being in the studio and painting all day and enjoy that so much that if it results in having a show that's like a very big bonus but it's not the reason why i do it so like when 
cool things like that happen. And let's say, for example, now I'm probably going to have an exhibition in October in New York. And it's like, it's extremely cool that you get the opportunity, but you don't do it for the opportunity. It's more of just like you do it because you like it. And the opportunity is a consequence of you doing it so much because you like it so much that it kind of works out. And people must like what you produce. Yeah, I hope so. It, it seems like it at <laughs> least. So, and I'm, I'm happy for it, which is also like one of the reasons why I'm able to go back to New York and work with it is because at least some people like it enough to buy it, which makes me happy. <laughs> Oh, amazing. So, if if you can think back to yourself, seventeen, eighteen years old, uh, after what you kind of the, the journey you've had in college, like, uh, what what do you say to other seventeen, eighteen year olds that are thinking about this? I think, I mean, at least it's difficult to give advice to someone that's like in a different, a very different headspace than yourself. But at least if you're um, going over there. Um, in a s similar position as my, myself, not that you had to like, oh, I'm super focused in art, but just that you're like, you're going there and you're not perhaps thinking about being becoming the world's best footballer. You're going there because you think it's a cool op opportunity. I think just being very aware that the reason why I go there is not necessarily to uh, just have fun all the time and that like, you're going there because the things that you're going to experience are things you haven't been experiencing before. You're going to meet people that you are going to find it more difficult to connect with and all the more interesting because you have to, I don't know, move out of your own, um, call it like, ideas of what you've experienced. You realize that, like, at least for me, coming from Norway, I felt obviously very privileged before I traveled down there. And then you realize you're in a college where... A lot of people have to pay a lot of money to go there and you're also um, call it surrounded by other people in a place of privilege and you're perhaps the most privileged guy which means that you're extremely privileged out of all you know so you get like a perspective that you wouldn't have gotten if you didn't move over and that's probably one of the things that I'm most grateful about the perspective part because then when you come back you get to appreciate not only the people around you but like the comforts of having a family having a place where things are just it just it just works it flows whereas like when you move go to college you have to make sure it kind of it's not going to work by itself so you have to like put in the effort and that's probably the way it's going to be for the rest of your life as well cuz at some point you got to grow up um and so you you're grown up now uh, definitely <laughs> not not at all but i'm more i think i'm a lot more mature than what i was when i uh went down there um, so I think just being comfortable with being uncomfortable is probably my my best advice and realizing at least what I do often when like let's say I'm having a bad injury or I'm uh, like the last year wasn't even very easy for me because I was li living in Chinatown in New York and the rent is very high in New York and being an artist is not always the easiest because you're my, you might have an exhibition and then you might earn a bit of money but you're going to have to like plan out like half a year in advance because you're not going to make any money for half a year because you're working towards a new exhibition. And then when rent is high and living in New York is not cheap either, it, it, it gets a bit difficult. And then you kind of, at least what I do is like jump, like I th view myself as like a 40-year-old looking back at where I were in my career at that point. And I think you're going to romanticize it when you're like, oh, you're 20, like running around in New York, like... Uh, with no money you have to do everything you can to survive you know what I mean it's it is also a bit beautiful but it's difficult to see it when you're in the middle of it so I think if you're able to like get a call it a wider perspective of where you are and what kind of like um, the adversity is going to give you instead of what it feels like there and then but then again some people move over to college in the U.S. and it's like this like beautiful road, like one way direction, just like playing all the games, everything works out. They win, you know what I mean? It's like, it's a very different experience. But e for me, at least, that was the thing. E that every journey is different. Yeah, but I, it's a great point because I think that's what a college degree, those four years, you you go to class and you learn the stuff in textbooks, and hopefully you remember to tick the right box on the multiple choice. Yeah. Maybe in graphic design you don't do multiple choice as much as we did, uh, or you did in business. Uh, but the concept of traveling, going to a new place. I lived in Hong Kong for a while. 
me and my then girlfriend, now wife, we lived in downtown Hong Kong on 10 square meters apartment, <laughs> apartment room. Yeah. Or we had a toilet, we had a <laughs> living room, we had a, a rice cooker for and, yeah. and a one one tabletop for cooking, uh, and we had a wardrobe hanging over the bed. But the perspective of that, it was fun. Yeah. We, I mean, we didn't have much money back then, uh, and you were just uh, starting out, just out of college, and so then the thirty square meter place that was the next one that was a mansion, yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Yeah. But we lived in downtown Hong Kong. Probably similar to living in Chinatown in uh, in New York, and you just uh, look back at it and like, wow, that was cool. You know, I was working during the night because uh, you know I was doing this time difference. Time difference to the U.S. was twelve hours. Yeah. So I, you know, when I came back, the city woke up because I, I worked from a the sixty fifth story uh, skyscraper at night when the city was dead. And then I would go home and sleep when the city woke up. Yep. And it's just, that's one of those perspective things you talked about there. So, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you, you take that approach and, and, and feel that you learned in that way. And I think a lot of us and our students that we've helped, I think they have that. Might not have explained it the way you did, which I thought was great, but this is what going out of your comfort zone, out of your home country and yeah. experience things will do for you. I, I think. mean, for me, it was moving to Chinatown was like a big step up because I was living in Jersey in a basement apartment, whereas we didn't have, we were three uh, three guys on the team who lived in one uh, apartment and we had we had our own bedrooms, but we didn't have a living room. So my bedroom was a living room and I couldn't afford a studio either. So I was painting in my bedroom which was also the living room and which was also the place where I was working freelance graphic design and eating all my dinners. So it was like, it is very weird. And then like, it was in the basement. So we had like two, it was flooded like two times where we like woke up in the middle of the night with like cockroaches and like, and the, the sewer up to our legs. You know, it's very different because I've never experienced that before. And although it like right there when you're like walking around in, in the sewer, you're not really like super happy about it. But then looking back at it, it was like, it was kind yeah. of oh. cool. At least an experience. Yeah. Is, is it a paradox an artist not being able to afford a studio? I um, <laughs> It is. I think it was probably not the best because you probably like shorten your lifespan with like 50% because you're like inhaling all like the toxins. If you're like walking around and you're like, you're painting in your living room or in your bedroom and you're also like looking at the unfinished painting all the time and you're like, oh, I just, I just got to work, you know what I mean? Because I can't look at this unfinished painting. But then now I'm working in a, like, I still have to travel an hour and a half to get to my studio from Chinatown. So I like commute three hours a day almost, which is like, you just have to take it because you don't really have the money to pay for anything in Manhattan. Oh, but it's passion and you're passionate. Uh, of course. Bernard, it's been super interesting to talk to you. A different perspective than yep. many, but I, I love your journey. Uh, and I, I'm going to check out your exhibition, of course, and uh, uh, maybe put, a, put up one of these uh, paintings on my wall then. We'll see. <laughs> I think you have to. We have no choice now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But thank you so much and good luck in New York in the fall, uh, Bernard. Thank you, Kim. <laughs>